afternoon, good afternoon, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining me on a very special edition of Ask Sharifa Videocast and Podcast. I love every show, every edition, everyone I sit down and speak with, but some shows are a little bit more special than others, and that's what's happening with today's show. Our guest today has been a guest on the Roundtable Talk Show several times. We've enjoyed learning about who he is, what he does, and what he has going on. But today we have the opportunity to sit down with the CEO of Danby Appliances and learn more about his journey. So before I go ahead and bring in the CEO, please go ahead and share the show because there's so many people who will never have the opportunity to learn from this great man. If you don't go ahead and share the show, we are speaking today with Mr. Jim Estelle. Jim is the CEO of Danby Appliances. Danby Appliances is a niche marketing manufacturer of specialty appliances, which manufactures and distributes over 2 million appliances per year. Jim Steele is leveraging his tech background to create new markets and products for Danby, such as the Danby Parcel Guard. I guess we'll be able to learn about that today. Jim is a Canadian technology entrepreneur, executive, and philanthropist. He started his first computer distribution business from the trunk of his car while in university and grew that business to $2 billion in sales. Jim was also the EY Entrepreneur of the Year for 2019 Ontario winner and has received both the Order of Canada and Order of Ontario. Good afternoon, Jim, how are you? I'm great, how are you today? I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. I couldn't wait to speak to you. Now, before I go into all our discussion, why is it that every time I speak to you, your hair is longer, Jim? Well, we have this thing here in Canada called COVID and they close all of the non-essential services and they think that hair cutting is non-essential. So um, as long as there's COVID, I guess I'll just make it until my hair is longer than yours. How's that? <laughs> well, let me know. I might have to go to Canada and cut it for you, Jim. <laughs> now, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you. The Danby wine cooler fridge has changed my life. It is incredible. But I'll let you know, I modify your product. It, it, it is now a wine cooler slash bar. Oh, great. Awesome. Excellent. Now, uh, that problem when you say that, I'm hoping it's not modifying it. Like you haven't become too alcoholic on me, have you? <laughs> no, not at all. But I have to do something on the weekends. And now since I placed it in my room, I hardly ever leave the room. I hardly ever leave the room. I have a nice little bar at the top, nice little uh, wine bottles. I even put water bottles and orange juice in their bill. That's a gym. Sorry, I'm messing up your name. You can't imagine how much you changed my life. Awesome, excellent. I'm happy to do it. Do you have a happy birthday? Yes, I did. It was incredible. It was incredible. I had so many people who came out to celebrate the day with me. And one of the reasons it was so important for me to do it is because it wasn't just about my birthday for me. It was about not being able to celebrate for the last year, not being able to meet so many people that I love, to see them, to hang out, to have a hug. And so I just wanted to celebrate life, not just my life. So it was wonderful. Um, everyone had a wonderful time. But you helped me to make that day very special. One of the things that I saw when I was Googling the internet is you also help other people as well. You help some refugees. I would love to hear the story behind that. Well, uh, Canada ha has a private refugee program, <coughs> excuse me, which they allow people to individually sponsor and bring people into Canada. Success for us is people speaking English, having working, um, and having some degree of integration. So I brought in about 500 refugees under that program. I originally said I was gonna bring in 50 families. Um, this was back during the Syrian crisis. And since then I've brought, branched out, I don't just, haven't done just Syrians. I've done uh, people from Eritrea and uh, uh, even one from family from Venezuela and, and different uh, Congo, different countries and whatnot. Uh, what we have to realize is our life is pretty good and a lot of other people's lives are not that good and so we should try to do our part to make the world a better place now i'll, I'll also say in that sharifa 
that's a lot more than just bringing them into Canada. That's resettling. So yeah, so I had 800 volunteers that did the work of meeting them at the airport and setting up a bank account and registering the kids in school and getting them a bus pass and riding the bus with them and helping them write their resumes and going to English as a second language school and all of that kind of stuff, because it's all about helping people through a hard time so that they can integrate in a safer society than where they came from. But when I hear you speak, it seems just like, oh, it's everyday life, every day in the world. I had to help some people, but there are millions of people who haven't and wouldn't have done the same thing. What was your motivation to where you said, I have to do something? Well, see, I'm lucky because I started my business, I grew it to a reasonable size, I sold it and I retired. And that was when I really realized I don't like being retired. And what is the purpose of life? Purpose in life is to help as many people as possible achieve their greatest potential. And so, so it actually liberated me so that I, I work to help people. I don't, I, that's, I, I have enough. I know I have enough. As a matter of fact, I actually think that wealth, um, wealthy people often end up with a, a problem mentally that they think they need more money. I have friends that are worth $100 million and they need more money, but how much more wine can you drink? Like how much more food can you eat? How much more should you eat? Um, and I also don't particularly like things because my experience is things take time. And uh, so I like my more modest life. And so I worked to, to give back and the refugee thing was just one way I could give back because at that time I just saw, you know, people, you know, Ali Kurdi washing up on the beach in Greece uh, from uh, trying to I remember that. that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it was it was horrific. It still is horrific. There still is millions of refugees, and our life is really good. If matter of fact, if we have problems today, what we have is first world problems. Oh, I tell my kids that all the time. I tell my children that all the time. You know, exactly. their problems are the Wi-Fi went out for a couple of minutes. You know, fifteen minutes, the Wi-Fi is down, and it's like. Okay, but there are places in the world where they don't have wife, they don't have electricity. Let's start there. That's right. You're totally right. You're totally right. And and so everything, everything, every, partly success or happiness in life is also being grateful. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've learned, uh, if you are depressed at all, help someone else. You help someone else, it it it's it lifts you up as much mm -hmm. as the other person. So. Well, let's talk about, I want to talk about little Jim, little Jimmy. Okay. You're a serial entrepreneur. Every time you're on the show, we talk about being a serial entrepreneur, but were you raised that way? Cause you talk about your friends, a hundred million dollars. And I need some of those friends, by the way, but what, how did you get that attitude? That's different from theirs. Was it your parents, your, you know, grandparents, where did it come from? Well, you know, you know, I don't really know. I know at a very early age, I did entrepreneurial things. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in relatively modest uh, means, so I uh, felt I needed to contribute. So I, you know, we do sell the produce that we make in the garden to the neighbors and and whatnot. So uh, I had multiple little businesses, and I had one business when I was in high school, painting houses. That I was actually quite successful. I ended up with probably twenty employees and uh, whatnot when I was in high school, and that gave me the taste of entrepreneurship. So that when I, I, I did go to university, well, that was the other thing. My dad said, oh, you want to go to university? Great. How are you going to pay for it? So I had to pay my university. And so that created a bit of an entrepreneurship. I, at, at the time, I thought I needed to make money to, uh, to do that. I'm not even sure why that was such a driving goal, but it was. So I like it. It sounds interesting. I want to go back to those 20 employees because... Again, a couple of things that we talked about on various shows is you talk about expansion, expansion and building a company to be an asset that can be sold. In high school, how did you even know then that you had to grow and expand? There are so many companies that may have been in business for 20, 40, 50 years, but it's still a one person solopreneur mom and pop shop. Ah, uh, you know, I, I think it's because I'm overambitious. So I would go out and I 
I drive, uh, th then I didn't even have a car because I was too young to drive. And so I drive my bicycle. I see a house that needs painting. So I, I had these flyers all pre-made up and I'd write it down, you know, I paint your house for $200 or whatever and stuck it in the door and, and called Jim's painting. And <laughs> I ended up with more work than I could do. Mm -hmm. And so if I couldn't do it myself and I worked very long hours, then I hired my brothers. And after I hired my brothers, it was easy to hire my, my friends. And next thing you know, everybody wants to work for me. So uh, that, that was how we, I just hire everybody. You always make it, bring it down to the simplest, the, the base numerator, you know, it's just like people need work. I hire them, they come work for me. But 20 employees, going to high school, painting homes. I mean, is, is this even something you're trained to do? Well, no, I mean, I, I started painting because my dad wanted me to paint the fence and he showed me how to do it. And uh, so I painted the fence. And then one of the neighbors <laughs> said, oh, listen, you're painting the fence. Can you come and paint my fence? So, and, and the neighbor's willing to pay me. So, oh, this is, this is and back then it, it, at the time was, what uh, seemed like a lot of money. So, oh, great, I'll go paint the, the fence. And then I said, oh, well, we're gonna have a business. I'm gonna call it Jim's Painting. What else would I call it? And then, uh, and then I started, uh, I guess I'm a natural marketer. So I would have, you know, a little easel sign out on the front lawn saying, you know, Jim's painting. Back then we didn't have cell phones. It, you know, you call the home number, my mom would answer the phone. And uh, so it, 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 that, that was just how I did it. Competitive advantage I had back where I was growing up, the painters who were in business painting, they didn't show up on time. They didn't, um, they weren't polite. They didn't take their shoes off when they went into someone's house. Like they, they were slobs partly. And so my competitive advantage, I was just a polite kid. I'd show up, I'd be polite. And, you know, if I was going to be there at nine, I'd be there at nine. I, you know, and whatnot. So that was my competitive advantage. I guess another competitive advantage is I didn't, I worked hard and I didn't, I sort of undervalued my time. So I do an awful lot of work for the dollars I charge. Oh, wow. I like that. Philosophies. Now, you also mentor companies. Are these part of the strategies that you give the companies that you mentor? Uh, yes. I, I mean, I don't, don't even know why I do that, but I, I'm a natural networker, so I put people in touch with people, and I also uh, like being creative. And it's easy to be creative on the sidelines, to come up mm -hmm. with ideas from the sidelines. So that's how I uh, come up with some of the ideas for mentoring. Mm -hmm. But what would you say, like if you just had a new business owner starting out and they want to start a business, what would you say are your top two, top three pieces of advice that are must haves? Uh, first thing I do is uh, I believe in failure. Fail often, fail fast, fail cheap. Don't be afraid of failure. Having a failure does not make you a failure. The people that strike out are the ones that swing. You don't swing at the ball. You never hit a home run either. So um the other thing I'd suggest is just do it. I know a lot of entrepreneurs, they say, oh, I've got this great idea and they're going to research it and then they're going to do more study on it. And then three years later, they're still doing more study on it. My <laughs> advice is go do it, right? Yes, I, I see that a lot, especially with entrepreneurs. But when I look at your resume, your bio, to me, and, I, and there's probably some things I, I'm not seeing from here, but it's success after success after success. You just sold yet another company. So what failures? You, you, were, you had 20 employees as a kid. Oh, so, so um, one of the reasons that you see my successes, like I'm a, I, I invested in over 150 technology companies. Oh, wow. One of those companies was BlackBerry. So you say, mm -hmm. wow, Jim, you're a genius. That's one of those companies. 25 of them I sold, 125, you've never heard of them because they went bankrupt, they went out of business. So what did I do? I tried more, I tried harder, I tried more things. And, but you tend to forget your failures. And the, the key is it's fail often, I failed often, fail fast and then fail cheap. Where people make a mistake is if they don't follow the fail cheap and you go bankrupt, I mean, that's not failing cheap or you don't fail often enough means you try. So I'm a little unfocused. Everyone always says, oh, you should be high focus. I think when you're starting a business, you want to be unfocused because you don't know what will be your main thing. Mm -hmm. And you don't know where you're going to make the most of your money. If it's, and so you want to try 
doing paid conference and then doing a speaking gig and then writing a book and then blah, blah, blah. And you're going to find out, oh, well, writing a book that that's that's the one that, you know, makes the money or maybe it's the speeches that make more. Maybe it's the private sessions or or whatever. So it's uh, I just try a lot of different things. And then when something starts to work, then I do more of it. That's mm -hmm. what I do. So you invested in 150 companies. Yes. Over what time span? Uh, you know, that was over a long time because I'm old. You're not old, Jim. Stop it. <laughs> I'm just trying to see. So that was probably over a 20 year period, maybe 25 year period. So, you know, I, my business that I started that I grew to 2 billion in sales, we were a distributor of computer products. Okay. So we sold uh, everything from printer cables to monitors, to disk drives, to memory chips, to um, um, software um, printers and whatnot. Well, when I was in that business, I saw a lot of new companies. I saw a lot of new technologies and many of them were startups. So I was able to invest in some of those new, new companies. And often I'd be able to use my distribution cloud to help the company. And if I help the company, I basically am helping my own, my own investment become successful. So it was one of my, uh, one of my tricks, just like you, Sharifa, you actually have a, a you have a, a wide audience. And if you were to go and invest in a company and then you use your audience to promote whatever it is, the company you invested, you help that company. It, it helps the company be more successful. When I look at it like that, it does. It, it makes sense. I'm actually going the opposite direction. I'm looking for the company to invest in the talk shows to use the audience to grow the, the um, whole brand. But we'll get there one day. But I want to go back to the 150 question, uh, companies over 20, 25 years. Were there any companies after investing in 150 that you missed out on, that you look and go, oh my God, I wish I would have invested in that one. For me, not that I'm a huge investor, but it was obviously the Zoom. Um, I wish I would have invested in Zoom. So many more of them, but you know, after COVID and the stock going up about 700%, at least at one time, I was like, man, I wish I'd have invested in Zoom. I've been using it for years. Yeah, so I, um... The biggest one I miss is probably before, you wouldn't even remember, but Lotus. I asked I me, do Lotus Notes. Lotus, yes, at Lotus okay. Notes, Lotus One Two Three, and they asked they wanted me to invest, and I said no, I don't invest in software because people copy software too easily, and that I missed a big one. But of course, that sort of did like BlackBerry. It's you know went through the roof and then it dropped back, right? But uh, that was a a big one. Uh, but I've missed many of the other. Um, later successes like mm -hmm. Twitter, like Facebook, mm -hmm. like Pinterest. I didn't do any of those uh, social media. But those are all social media. What Did you have an aversion to social media? Did yeah. you say, you know what, it's not going to last. I'm not going to get in on that. I, 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 did, I wasn't sure that it would, I didn't understand. Yeah, I, I didn't understand or think that it would be as big as it would. But, you know, that, that's one of the things I missed. And I liked physical product because physical product, I could see the advantage and how difficult it is. I mean, I sent you a wine cooler. You can make wine coolers. You can copy that wine cooler, except it's damn hard. And right. where I could send you to my website to go some social media and you can, you know, you can kind of copy that. It's just not, it didn't seem as, as bigger barriers to entry. And the other thing is I'm a little bit of an old fashioned business person. And a lot of those social media companies for years, they didn't make any money. It's like, oh, do this for free. Well, you can do this for free, but uh, like <laughs> you don't make any money doing it for free forever, right? <laughs> but you, I mean, as someone who's invested in over 150 companies, you must have a strategy. There must be some formula, some one plus one equals two. If you do this with your business, you'll be successful. I mean, just going to $2 billion from starting out the trunk of your car. And I and I recognize that story. One of the first companies I worked for was Cheap Tickets. Um, CheapTickets.com is kind of a big thing, or at least was here in Los Angeles. But Mike Hartley and his wife started that company selling tickets, airline tickets, out of the trunk of their car. So is there a formula to success? Well, when I'm investing, I look at three different aspects. I look at sales and marketing, how difficult it's going to be to sell. I look at technical, how, you know, can you build it? Is it rocket science? Is it easy to copy? 
um, and I look at business. Is it, is, is, does it have a business model and can it make money? So I want those three areas to all be covered. Then I overlay all that with the person because the problem is you can have the you know, a greatest business and you've got a profitable model and technically you figured out how to do it and sales and you've got to figure out how to sell it. And then you have a, a, the person who's not gonna put the time in or not gonna execute. And the, the problem on people is when I would invest, I'm also often investing when a company is very tiny and you can't really know the scalability. So I could say, you know, you're a great person and you work well, but does that mean you work well when you have 100 employees or 500 employees? It, it's really hard to know who scales uh, up uh, size wise. But, mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, I don't have any secret to investing success. And as, as far as entrepreneurial secrets go, um, it's mostly just get up to bat more and uh, mm -hmm. try more things. Um, I'm a big believer in work ethic. I'm a big believer in pay it forward. And, uh, and I, I don't believe in greed. And so the, the more you can be generous with your, your time and your, um, what you do, then sure enough, someone's coming back sometime to do something for me. And I, I can't even say, say what it is. It's not one for one either. Right. Mm -hmm. And no, I, I believe the same thing. I believe the same thing, but one of the things that I think it was our very first interview that interests me about you is that you had this. Um, persona where you would go in the lunchroom prior to COVID and you would sit down with employees and you never had this attitude or this big head where, you know, it's big CEO, it's big Jim and little everyone else. And you talked about how you learned from the employees. I would love for you to share that experience with us. Well, well, this has been the, the biggest problem in COVID is I can't walk the halls anymore, walk through the factory or have lunch in the lunchroom because I'm very much bottom up, but that's because I started from zero. When you start from zero, like I, I know how to drive a forklift. I mean, you, you kind of got used to doing this kind of stuff. So I never, I never started as a CEO at a high level working in an office. And in a way, I'm actually more comfortable working in a, in a factory, in a, in a back office than I am working at a, uh, you know, a too high of a level. But you're right, you learn things. There's nothing better than go out into a factory and you can just see things and you find things. I, I had an engineer start for me. And the first thing I did is I, I said, get your safety shoes on, let's go. You know what we're doing? Let's go look in the dumpster. Why do you look in a dumpster? That's where your mistakes are. Well, how come we're having a problem? This part's not working, like what's going on? We have, um, we need a different tool to put it in with. We're, you know, the supplier is, you know, what, why are we causing damage? Look at your garbage. That's where you figure out where the uh, where the top of the process is. I use that closed loop also on all our customer service calls, any of our product uh, returns or anything. You analyze well. Why did someone return this product? Why did the door break? Why did and and just keep asking and figure out. Oh well, we need a stronger hinge. We need um, and actually you, you have to build uh, home appliances like Danby does. You have to build them idiot proof so you have to make the assumption that someone is going to uh put 200 pounds weight on the door when they stand up on it like, you, you, like it's not a logical assumption but that's what people do sharif you know that so you have, yes. to, you have to um build for the uh build for the worst if you know what i mean I do because usually I'm the worst. Believe me. I, um, another wonderful thing about my birthday, I'm really just coming down from this whole experience, is uh, Codex Beauty, one of the guests on my show. We did an interview. She sent me this huge box of um, skincare for my skin. Like, so now I have this skincare regimen, and she sent it back in March. And so I got the box and then I opened it. And it's, it's a lot of products in here. And I set it down. I said, well, when we do our interview, she can explain it to me. So I go to do the interview and I told her, I said, I have these products. I'm grateful. I appreciate them. But what do I do with them? I know it says moisturizer, but like what order do I do? Like what goes first? And so she now she's literally redesigning her website to add steps to, thanks to Sharifa, you oh, know, good. I didn't get a royalty, but she's adding steps to the products. Like step one is the is the moisturizer. Step two or step one is the cleanser. Moist, you know, and take it down for people like me. Well, and we do that. If, if someone calls in customer service, they ask questions and they say, 
what's the inside dimensions of the fridge? Well, we didn't think to put the inside dimensions on. on. Oh, people ask the question, let's put it on our website. People mm -hmm. say, what's the, uh, you know, how many amps does this draw? That's a logical question. I want to know whether I can run at my trailer. I want to know whether I can put it on this circuit. So we, we just listen to what they say and then put more and more on the website essentially so they don't have to call us so that they know what the answer is over time. It's all closed loop. It's one of the principles. Everything, everybody who calls, I solve your problem and figure out how no one else will have the same problem. And maybe that means putting a sticker on the door that says, you know, take the, uh, take the foam stopper off the, the handle <laughs> before you use it. Or I, I don't know, I have no idea, right? That's the, those unnecessary stickers they'll have on pillows and beds and like do not remove sticker well i don't know but they have these stickers. oh exactly yeah well it's that's because then what you do is you have to then go to the lawyers like i'm sure you saw on the wine cooler you have it says do not swallow because yes i saw that you swallow, you swallow the wine cooler it's like it's just not good for you yes but i also saw the sticker that was very helpful to me not that i've used it as of yet but that the door was reversible a little sticker that says you can reverse the door based on where you have it and so i was trying in different places i was like well i might need to reverse the door and the sign says i can so i was very happy with the instructions i opened it up plugged it in and my life changes i don't i don't leave my room i'll tell you that i come out do my interviews and my life is good but i want to go back to something you said about sales when you were giving us your um importance and you said sales but one of the things that we always talk about is not just selling the product but selling the company so you keep that in mind early on when investing or even start a company correct oh yeah absolutely i, I mean if i'm investing i'm i'm looking at how Will, how easy will it be to sell the sell the product and what's the marketing plan and will it sell because you can have a great product that you're going to sell but it's going to cost you i mean i could be selling pens and the problem is it can cost me two dollars to sell every pen that i can only sell for a dollar fifty i don't have a business plan it's tough, tough too tough to sell everyone needs pens but you don't need very many pens and you don't use pens as much as you used to and right you have pens so uh i definitely look at the saleability and in a company in my companies, everything starts with sales because that's what what triggers everything else in the painting business. I, I, I'd sell another house painting contract. Well, then I need to hire two people to help because we have too much too much work. And then I have to figure out how to, you know, buy the paint a little cheaper by uh, negotiating a better price on the paint. Or maybe we need a taller ladder or better scaffolding or whatever. <laughs> I don't know, whatever it was, but you had to figure out that problem. But companies, the assets, selling them off. Let's, can we talk about, I don't know if you want to talk about it or not, the company you just sold. Yeah, the company I just sold is Shipper B. And Shipper B is a courier company, essentially like FedEx or UPS. And so we built that. I uh, That was a spinoff of Dan B. Uh, I built it with the intention of selling it. So that's what we did. We built it and we sold it. Um, and, and, and uh, I believe a decade from now, it may have an impact on how couriers carry your parcels, which mm -hmm. that is also something I think is very cool. If you can be a part of the start of something, mm -hmm. that really is a, a cool thing. See, I'm going to say um, when Sharifa has her own TV show and she's a little bigger than Oprah, I'm going to say, you know, I knew Sharifa when, when she interviewed, I, I'm going to call Sharifa and she'll return my call. You see that? That's, that that's the way it is, right? It's like, yeah, Sharifa, Oprah, yeah, it's, it's no big deal. Yes, and Sharifa will be calling you like, Jim, remember back in the day when we first started, we had the guests. And remember that wine cooler you sent me? I still have that wine cooler. That's how I am. But I just love business. I love entrepreneurship. It's a passion for me. But one of the reasons it became a, a passion because my first job out of high school was working, you may remember this company, was working for TWA. Trans World Airlines. And I'm this little kid, 18 years old, right out of high school. And I go work for this company, major, huge company. And I noticed that they're faxing reservations to their pass to the passengers. And I said, why don't you just email them the reservations? Okay. And TWA's, or at least the person's um, response to me was, this is the way we'll always do it this is the way we've always done it this is the way we will always do it and i'm not saying that's the reason 
I'm saying they're no longer in business. And so from then I had this idea, I wanted to be a part of startups. I wanted to be a part at the beginning when you create, because so often companies, as they get older, they get stuck in their ways. Do you find in less flexible, do you find that to be true, Jim? Oh, that's, that's totally right. Because people don't tend to disrupt themselves. Other mm -hmm. people outside the industry disrupt them. I mean, even the most recent big example is Tesla. Right. Should Tesla be the company that, that brought out the electric car? No, it probably should have been Ford or GM or Chrysler. But why was it Tesla? Because the rest of the companies are spending time on internal combustion engines. And how do you make my, my uh, motor with less cylinders faster, better gas mileage? They weren't all about electric. So it tends to be that people outside the industries disrupt industries. The other trend is industries tend to get disrupted from the bottom up as well. So um, it doesn't, well, well, you remember when uh, uh, Toyota, Hyundai comes into the market. It used to be a Hyundai was not a really good car, but now you know, they make a pretty good car, right? So they, you disrupt from the bottom and now they come up, oh, Hyundai Sonata, that's a pretty good car. And, and um, even with Toyota, when they came into the market, weren't that good. Over time, they became um, very powerful. So uh, you but I saw that with, with Uber too, you yeah. know what I mean? Because they started from the bottom in that for a long time, people who would say, oh, I'm not taking an Uber. I'm not riding with strangers. And then all of a sudden it became the coolest thing. And it became more of a taboo to drive and, you know, mess up the planet keep less cars off the street than to actually take a Uber. So that revolutionized a whole transportation industry. You're totally right. They disrupted the taxi industry. It wasn't the taxi industry that disrupted the taxi industry. Now when right. you go to New York, there is actually a yellow cab app that, on your phone. So like the, the industry finally came up with a weak, weak sister to <laughs> that because they got uh, disrupted. And, mm -hmm. and Interestingly enough, the taxi drivers are a little more polite than they used to be because they had competition from people that want to get better ratings. And it's uh, it, we, we just changed uh, the way we are. But you have to change in order to grow. But then you also don't want to change too much to go too far away from who you are, who you are as at the base and at the root. How do you stay I almost want to say in business, but how do you stay growing with like appliances? I know one of the things that we discussed during COVID is that you've actually been creating appliances and coolers to take the vaccine. So there seems to be, you know, as necessity arises, different things that you can do. Well, that, well, that's one of the things I do is I look at trends. And if you see what's happening trend wise and get on those trends and there, every entrepreneur listening there is a business in pandemic, and then there's a post-pandemic economy. What's different, going to be different in post-pandemic economy? The more you can think of that, the more you'll be able to come up with products and services that cater to the post-pandemic economy. I mean, the simplest example, we're all going to be ger germaphobes post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's an obvious one. So if I made clothing, I might make one with a mask built in so I can pull it up over my, uh, my face if I'm going in someplace. I mean, that, that's a... A, a dumb but simple idea no that's a great idea that i'm about to do right now i'm about to create a shirt with a mask so yes Perfect. thank you Jim. do it do it you go go and do it uh we we sell uh, air conditioners um an air conditioner has a fan it's moving air why not put a uv light into filter and, and a filter you because everybody's gonna be afraid of germs that's another example everybody is uh there's a lot more people work at home so we had a pretty good business selling bar fridges to hotels and motels. And then all of a sudden, nobody's going to motels during COVID. But now everyone's working at home. Everyone needs a, a bar fridge in their, in their room. But your bar fridges that people have in their basement or in their room, they tend to want larger, a little larger than what the hotels want. So what do you do? You just retool and go a little bit bigger because that's what the consumer wants is a bigger one because they're putting in the basement, putting in the garage. They've got more space. Hotel rooms, they often want it to be quite small because they don't have as much space. And the trend in hotel bar fridges were smaller and smaller. So it's looking at those trends and every industry has their trends. I'm talking about little micro trends in my industry. I believe post pandemic, we're not quite there yet, but we will be. There's going to be a massive amount of vacation travel. Yes, because absolutely. Everyone's stuck at home. I, I, I want to go to LA. I, I have a holiday, right? It's, and so 
that's uh, that means for me resort travel will be big i actually think utility travel will not be strong and utility travel is that's where i would stay when i visit my factory in finley ohio i stay in a you know travel lodge you're staying in a um, holiday in a, a relatively utility hotel i because i've been a whole year without traveling and i realized I don't need to get on a plane every other week. Maybe I'll just do a lot more Zoom. And uh, I think so. I think utility travel might tail down a little, but it'll take a spike to start with because I want to visit my daughter who lives on the East Coast. And I haven't seen her in a year. I haven't seen my grandkids in a year because we're not allowed to. Right. Yeah, so more travel for pleasure is great. But you have some gold there, Jim, that I want to go back to. I want to go back to a word that, that you use. You said retool. And too often, I find that companies are afraid of retooling or they, they say they don't have the finances or the resources to do it. So let's just stick with the current product as is. Well, I mean, the real answer is if you don't retool, then someone else is going to retool and then you're going to wake up still trying to send faxes to your customers because, <laughs> because your competitor is doing it by email. And, and, and that, is, that is the way it's, uh, it's going to be. So I always look at it. If you're not going to re, do, redo your, yourself out of business, someone else is going to do you out of business. At the same time, yeah. always look at competitive advantage. So what are the advantages that you have and can you grow on those? And the beauty of competitive advantage is every company, regardless of how big they are, have advantages. So you might have an advantage because you can do something completely different tomorrow and you don't have to ask uh, 18 people and have a board meeting and whatnot. Where um, CBS, they can't actually do something very fast because they have to have a committee and, uh, and whatnot. So you've got an advantage that you can be faster than big companies. Um, and your overheads relative is is small, so you could you could you can pivot really fast uh, mm -hmm. if you want. You can you can change the name of your show to Ash Sharifa and Jim. It doesn't take much. <laughs> a little. Uh... No, I'm gonna have one of those. You should have told me this before, Jim. I would have had it ready for today's show. Now I don't know when I'm gonna see you again. You know what I mean? That's fun. I like that. And Jim, co-host, my my co-host. But I, I agree. I understand what you're saying. You have to be able to change and grow and pivot. Now, you mentioned large companies with Danby Appliances. Is it very, fairly easy for you to pivot when you go into the lunchroom, you know, when it opens back up and you sit down with an employee and they say, Jim, this really, you know, we, we need to add pink doors to the to the coolers because everybody's like, we have to have pink. How easy would it be for you to retool? So, uh... We, it's not it's not totally easy as a tiny company, but we still have competitive advantage because our competitors are Samsung, LG, Whirlpool. These companies are ten billion dollars, billions and billions of dollars in sales. So if you come to me and say you want to buy a hundred pink fridges, I'll probably do a hundred. I'll do a thousand. Where you go to LG and say you want to buy a hundred fridges, they're going to say, well, what do you mean we don't do a hundred fridges? How many? You mean a hundred containers of fridges? And right. So um, that's what I mean by competitive advantage. I like doing business that's the right size for the right person at the right. And, and so there's always business that's for the right size. And you probably don't want to compete head on with CBS. And someone who's just starting out um, a podcast probably doesn't want to compete with you yet. They compete with different. They can go into a tiny little niche that you're not in and they can have a uh and then they can grow into larger niches and whatnot so i hear you and what i've been told is interesting because i love doing the round table talk show especially is everyone starting to come on and starting to say oh this reminds me of clubhouse this is like clubhouse this is clubhouse and i'm like okay it's kind of like clubhouse but they're not that many people who do a podcast with five guests per show. So most people, you know, one person, you sit there, talk to them once a week, and that's it. But five shows a week, five guests per show, unheard of. Well, well, the other thing that I, I found unheard of is I've been on your show three or four times. And the diversity and variety, you, you have an entrepreneur that is one person and you've got someone with a thousand employees and you've got someone who's doing beauty and someone who's doing um, 
appliances and and you pull, you knit it all together beautifully Sharif you do an awesome job because you're you're talking to everybody regardless of whether they're uh, you know painting cars or doing whatever so very thank impressive. you thank you but you know it's been over 250 episodes one year 250 episodes at first that was the aspect that made me so nervous i was like oh my god you're gonna throw five random strangers into a conversation with no topic and have absolutely no idea what's going to happen and after a few months a few episodes i was like this is fun this is fun because you just find that we have so much more in common then, then that's different. And the key is that we're all in business in some form of fashion, we're all in business. It doesn't matter what the industry is. It doesn't matter what the level is, it's entrepreneurs and business owners. And I love to discuss business. That's my favorite topic because now I have, where else can I have the opportunity to just walk into Danby Appliances and say, Jim, tell me about your life. Tell me about how you made your money, Jim. You know, it's unheard of. So I just love to have these conversations. Well, the other the reason you're good at what you do also is because you love what you do. And I can tell yes. you love what you do. And if you love it, then you'll be great at it. If you hate it, then you won't be great at it. And it comes through, Sharifa. So really good on you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I received that into my spirit. Now, I am going to go ahead and close the show in a minute. But I, I have to let you know, my mother and about 12 other people said to me, I want a Danby wine cooler. Where's my wine cooler? They like, he didn't offer us a discount, a, a, a ask Sharifa rate, like nothing. I'm like, my mom's like, ask him. I said, I, when I speak to Jim, I'll ask him if there's a Friends of Sharifa deal or something. So I will do a Friends of Sharifa deal. So you know my assistant, capable assistant, Sherry, she'll come up with some sort of Friends of Sharifa and we'll send an email. And the other test I have, anyone who can find my email address, Jim asked, <laughs> I mean, if you can't Google it and find it, then you don't deserve it. Then send me an email and we'll definitely work something out. Thank you. I'm going to talk to Sherry. No, this has been a pleasure. I mean, just to pick your brain. That's what I do. Just pick people's brain. And I'm taking notes because you gave us a lot of gold today. But we are coming down to the last few minutes of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just simply allow my guests the opportunity to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who is watching the show live, as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives. And let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance here today, Jim. Well, earlier in the podcast, you asked me about my refugee project, and I learned the secret of happiness from my refugees. The secret of happiness is being grateful for what you have, not ungrateful for what you lost or ungrateful for what other people have. So really what I want is for your listeners and viewers to be happy and more satisfied in life and to realize if you're listening to the show, you have a lot to be grateful for and you probably aren't going hungry tonight. And there are a lot of people who do go hungry. So that's it. And of course, like I have to be, I'm a marketer. So of course, go buy lots of Danby bar fridges and uh, freezers. We'll have to do that too. And where can we find those, Jim? Uh, we're available at most uh, larger retailers, Costco, uh, Home Depot, and uh, all the little appliance stores and stuff like that. And of course, online, it's Danby, D-A-N-B-Y. It's not that, that difficult. So, uh, it, again, if you can't spell Danby, you probably don't deserve to own one either. So that's what it is. <laughs> well, I deserve to own one and I love it. It's changed my life. I'm just more of a recluse. Thank you, Jim. I'm more of a recluse <laughs> than I ever was. This is getting good. This is fun. I want to thank you for being today's guest on Ask Sharifa Videocast. And I especially want to thank everyone who tuned in to watch this show. I definitely appreciate you, but please go ahead and share the show. And as always, I ask that you support our guests. Go to Danby.com, go to the, your local store, but get you a Danby appliance. I guarantee it will change your life. So if you're interested in being a guest or more ways that I can help your business, please visit your web, my website at ashsharifa.com. Until next time, everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now.